everyone. Welcome. Welcome. Hey, this everybody. is Oz by Drone. I'm Greg. I'm John. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And I just want to say a big thanks to everyone for your support in um, subscribing to the channel. It's um, been really cool. We finally hit our target of 1,000 subscribers. Woohoo! Time to celebrate. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. So that was, actually, that was actually my birthday present to myself. So that was really, really cool. Speaking of which, a little bit later today, we are giving away this little puppy over here. So the DJI Osmo Mobile, we promised we're going to give it away when we get to a thousand subs and uh, we're there now. So if you haven't yet entered the video, mentions Osmo and um, you can still enter the competition. It's not too late. Big week, actually. Uh, lots of rest with it. Um, obviously, uh, people would have all heard about the fly, the um, uh, camera specs and so forth. Um, and, of course, in the Mavic line, very, very reliable aeroplane. But I suppose just a personal comment, I think the aeroplane flies very smoothly. They've done a little bit uh, of change to the flight modelling. Um, and particularly in the oar, it just seems to be a, a very, very um, smooth, and accurate aeroplane in the your plane. So, um, yeah, good work, DJI. We're, we're happy with the aeroplane. With something new coming out soon on the 28th. We're all waiting for time. it. We're waiting. Um, I, I don't know. We're, you know, we know that there's going to be some kind of uh, new handheld device. Tick. Um, the, there's a big, um, a, a big question whether they're going to release a Phantom 5. I, I'm sort of feeling like they're going to now, but um, and I've, I've been holding back on that. But, I've, I've got to have a bet each way, really, to deal with these things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've been saying that the Phantom 5 is coming. It's just a matter of timing. If they're going to do it before Christmas or after, if they do it before, obviously that's going to impact their Mavic sales and, you know, marketing departments don't want to do that kind of thing. But it's possible. Yeah, I, I still think now there's two kind of customers. You know, people that are settled on the Mavic, um, you know, tend to be quite, uh, you know, in favour of that aeroplane. They like the portability of it. Um, photographers tend to seem to don't care about that. They'd rather have the, the bigger camera platform, um, stable aeroplane and the things that the uh, mechanical shutter and so forth that the Phantom's got. The V2 having the Oc OcuSync. I mean, they are different. I'm, I, I'm, I suppose I'm someone they who's are. had both um, mm. side by side. Um, I, I couldn't pick because I'd want one for portability if I want to travel. Uh, which, you know, I've had the Mavic gone all over the world with me and flown, and the Phantom I take to work yeah. um, more regularly, you know. so Can I ask you, yeah, John, the, 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 the Mavic Enterprise, what's your view on that for well, commercial work? <laughs> Other than the search and rescue, the, the speaker thing's good, the flashing light's good, what about for the stuff that you're involved with? Yeah, I don't see a lot of um, use for it. I mean, it's got, a, it's got a beacon on top of it. That'd be nice to strobe light. Um, we've got aftermarket, you know, 3D printed beacon kit strobes that fit on, so forth. So I wouldn't get it for that reason. A, a pretty tight airplane. I mean, that's powered by the battery itself. You've got speakers. You've got forward-looking lights. Um, it won't be in our hangar, um, the Enterprise. I'd mm. want to see um, a big version. To my way of thinking, and it's not portable at all, but I want to see. I want to see an S600 size Mavic. Um, with uh, an, as an as an octocopter, I'm serious. You know, like a big, absolutely big foldable monster in that shape. Um, props on top and bottom, um, and dual battery system, and that'd be a really, really interesting aeroplane with that same tech in it to be able to have all sorts of enterprise loads with that. Um, but uh, currently, you know, the the pros are not very nice aeroplane, hard to beat. It is indeed. And um, coming soon, what's that? What's happening in the week ahead next week? Uh, we've got a conference actually up at COFS. We're looking forward to Tom, uh, my son and I, our new chief pilot for Morrison Air Robotics. Uh, he's coming up to COFS with me. We're going to do a conference for local government IT and uh, what is basically enabling local councils again to um, find the cost benefits for, for using ARPAS in their day-to-day um, -day workflow, if you like, and mm -hmm. also how, the, how to manage the data. Um, this is sort of an IT-based thing. So how data might be, uh, drone data might be integrated into council workflows. They do lots of things, uh, illegal dumping, compliance monitoring, land development. Councils are uh, uh, use a bit of everything uh, when Big it comes users. to drone technology. So yeah. we're looking forward to that. We'll get a couple of days. It's the Opal Cove Resort mm -hmm. in Coffs Harbour. You can check it out on the website. 
and uh, we'll be posting up lots of stuff on uh, on our Facebook site, and we'll uh, let you know about in coming weeks how it went and what it was all about. And speaking of next week, you're, I gather, not around next week, which leads me on to a question, and this is a question for our audience. Um, rather than me go and find a co-host, I thought I'd do something um, unique and um, ask you to send in via email after the show the best joke, the best gag. Whoever comes up with the best gag is going to be the co-host for next week. That's okay? a great idea. I like that. Except for me, of course. I can't go in it because I'm not going to be here. That Perfect. Okay. Uh, and and, speci- but- and of course, bonus points for drummer jokes. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. You're good. Yeah, drummer jokes we like. Trombone player jokes. Banjo jokes. Yeah. I got a lot of those too. <laughs> so this is our normal viewer video email address. So if you want to send in to, um, to that email address, that will reach us, upload at gregkunit.com. Send in your best joke and um, I'll judge it during the week. Whoever's got the best one, you will be the co-host next week. Excellent. Okay, lots of fun. So let's move on from that and we will get to... Ta-da! The news. And thanks as always to Jeff Sills. He does some great work pulling that stuff together for us. Um, If you do want to contribute to the news, go to Dronebook and there's a section in there, links. If you add a new link in there, it'll automatically come into the feed of stuff that we can potentially use for the show. So... By all means, um, do contribute to Dronebook in that way. Let's get started with the first story. Go to jail. Go to jail. Yes, an Australian pair were jailed for trying to use a drone to send drugs into prison again. A man and a woman uh, from Queensland have been arrested and sent to prison after attempting to use a drone to drop drugs. And that happened, I believe, in New Zealand. It was indeed in New Zealand. So um, here's the... Here, speaking of aeroplanes falling, that's behind you, but um, their aeroplane fell into the prison, which is why they were caught. I mean, if you, I if, if you want to go and get some drugs into prison and you're going to use a drone, you want to make sure you don't crash it. Absolutely. And, you know, the other thing is people seem to leave their SD cards in it. That's been a fault too, which very easily traceable uh, information on it sometimes. You know, you've got files that might have been deleted off it. Um, you know, got photos of mum and dad and your house and everything still yeah. on the SD card. Uh, however, um, we're not uh, actually condoning anyone try this. No. It seems like a lot of people are getting, more people are getting caught. And I'm, Greg, you did have the stats on how many. I'll come uh, back to that in just prisons. a second, but just to finish here. So um, man and a woman in Queensland were arrested and sent to prison after attempting to use a drone to drop drugs into a prison. It was... Um, they were returned, they came back to the jail, never go back to the scene of the crime. They came back no. to the jail after being paroled. So they were already in jail. Then they got out of jail on parole and then they tried to send the drugs in. It's, um, it's, it actually happened in Australia. I stand corrected. It wasn't in New Zealand, as I mentioned to you before. This was okay. in the um, Arthur Gorry Correctional Centre. Oh, that's Queensland. That's just uh, out of Brisbane, out of the Gold Coast, yeah. I know, yeah. I know it well. Yeah. Uh, we did some, we did some uh, detection work for those guys up there. One of the things about Arthur Gorry is that around the actual um, prison itself, a lot of bushland. You can put yourself anywhere there, um, but you still get caught. So um, there you go. Interesting. Yeah. And um, as you were kind of hinting, um, some numbers around that. So in the UK, this is some stats in the UK. Since 2015, there have been a total of 45 people that have been convicted of illicit drone activity, and those people involved have been jailed for a total of more than 140 years. All that hmm. since 2015. Yeah, wow. That's a, it's only a short time. Yeah. Anyway, so um, crime doesn't pay and neither does flying a drone into jail. Let's move on. Absolutely. Um, safety. Why is safety paramount to the growth of the drone industry? So, um, well, Rick, re- Rick, yeah, go, you go ahead. Okay. Regulators are still grappling with how to support commercial drone use while ensuring public safety, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, the FAA and the European safety agency, EASA are leading the way. We've got a video of a, um, a product and we're just going to play that. And this is something that's certainly, um, one way of helping drone safety in, um, in risky circumstances.
Today we're going to test the Safer M200 system. We're going to put the system on the drone, take the drone to about 200 feet up in the air. At that point, we're going to shut down the motors and our system will autonomously identify the malfunction. The idea is to take a real drone, put a sensor on it, get it up in the air with our system, cut the motors, and see what happens. This is going to be a one shot. We have cameras on the drone, cameras in the sky, cameras on the ground. We're going to capture it from all angles. You're going to see it go up, come down, and go up again. We do lots of experiments. Today, we chose to record one of them. We're going to take hover condition, which is the most challenging one, high winds, harsh terrain, and see that the system does what it's actually supposed to do and what our customers want to see. So I'll just um, turn the volume down there. And what we're seeing for John's benefit, he doesn't get the audio. We've got a drone. They're going to cut power to the motors. And there's our parachute dropping from behind there. So this is just one vendor. And I know Mick Malloy did send in um, another. Um, he to save the uh, Ballistic power over the, the last few years, over the last of course, we have um, ballistic shoots in the Cirrus aircraft, uh, manned aircraft these days. A lot of ultralights have had um, ballistic parachute systems. Again, they've reached quite a high level of sophistication. Probably one of the finest um, ones um, developed was for the Cirrus jet, the new Vision jet. Um, and to have a, a modern light jet with a ballistic parachute, it goes way back, um, the thinking, to the day, early days when, you know, of course, parachutes were first developed. And uh, during the uh, after the First World War and so forth, they were trying to save pilots, and they thought, you know, obviously jumping out of the aeroplane was the best thing to do, particularly if it's on fire, um, because if you've got a fire on board, um, a parachute doesn't help much because it only <laughs> lasts as long as it takes to burn. Um, and then we had we actually saw some very big innovations in parachutes with passenger airliners, where the wings would shed. Um, from the passenger cabin, and it could parachute the cabin to the ground. Very complex. Let me mm. just say right away, from an engineering standpoint, to have the wings um, disappear. Detach. Yeah. Yeah. The the F one eleven um, probably had one of the more sophisticated um, uh, lowering devices, where the entire uh, cockpit of the F one eleven had a parachute. A ballistic system with it where it shot off from the aeroplane and you're in a lifeboat if you went down in the water you're actually in a boat sitting in the cockpit uh with the two pilots so there's never going to that's never going to go away i think um one of the things to having better materials as we see um you know carbon kevlar um what lines and all sorts of really really strong we're going to see fireproof we're going to see um you know very affordable systems um for uh, uavs in the future and I think, you know, the smaller drones will benefit. I don't know whether we'll ever see one uh, attached to a, um, a Phantom or perhaps a Mavic as such, being the way what the benefits are for that. But um, certainly those enterprise-level uh, DJI craft like the Matrice and M600, um, perfect for parachutes. Yeah. Well, speaking of parachutes and um, their importance and their use, we're going to move to another story where this guy could have definitely used one. Um, so before we play the video, I'll just explain the, the background and I'll set up the story. So this is a guy who has a YouTube channel called Never Mind Your Own. And um, his name's Peter. And he's been traveling around and doing all sorts of beautiful, awesome drone photography. And he recently got on a plane. He traveled somewhere and his luggage was lost, which included his Phantom and multiple cameras and multiple pieces of audio and video recording equipment. And the airline will only give him apparently a thousand euros back against all of that. He didn't unfortunately have separate insurance. So there's problem number one. He gets to his place where he wants to film and he can't. And one of his fans said, look, I'll give you my Mavic Air to go and film with that. So he goes up and flies with the Mavic Air and the next thing you know, it crashes. There was a problem, uh -huh. a problem with its, I believe it's compass or IMU, I don't know the exact details, but to cut a long story short, it didn't crash in a way that it was unrecoverable. He got it back, gave it back to the guy and said, thanks, but no thanks. I don't want to be responsible for your drone. So he goes to buy a Phantom 4 Pro version 2. And on the maiden flight, we're about to see what happened next. And... Um 
film this area like this, maybe. So you guys can see where we are. Oh. The aircraft is connected. Well. Okay. Aircraft disconnected, two seconds later, smash. <laughs> now, Peter is the kind of a guy who, he, he's a very, very accomplished pilot, so I know his skills, um, but the plane just, the aircraft just fell out of the sky. Now, I don't know what's happening with his um, discussions with DJI, um, but if you are able and willing to um, help Peter out, I'm just posting something in the chat and hopefully it'll put it up there. I set up Nightbot so that it was going to respond to that command and it didn't. So I'll have to go and get that in there. Oh, there we go. So support Never Mind Your Own. We've got a PayPal link and a Patreon link there. Um, if you can help contribute to get Peter back in the air again, that would be really nice. This is his full-time occupation, YouTube video creation. And he's without his tools, so he can't create the stuff to put on the channel, and it's it's really not so good. And as a postscript, he's actually incredibly lucky that happened. <laughs> <laughs> Where it fell, and, yeah. Well, see, you know, there, there, and you know, it's it's a terrible thing that happened because the the people that that fell near, which were less than thirty meters away, and the cars that it didn't damage, he was very lucky. Look, um, and it's a good <clears throat> message to point out uh, at, at every turn because uh, you and I see it, but you guess what? There's a lot of our, our viewers there, Greg, that see the same thing, and they would want us to mention it. I believe that. I believe I they would want fully, us to mention it. I fully understand and agree with what you're saying. Having said you that, it. having said that, we've got 30 metres in Australia. They don't necessarily have that rule everywhere. I know mm -hmm. Peter well enough to know that good. You know, yeah. he... He may not do things the way we do in Australia, but he's still not yeah, stupid, sure. if you know what I'm saying. Well, that's probably good. If it does, don't have a 30-metre rule where he was flying, that's probably a good example of why you need a 30-metre <laughs> rule. <laughs> but having said, that, let, having said that, let me say this, and this I, I've looked at the bigger video at the time. He was flying vertically up. Yeah. Now, yes, he was close to some cars. Maybe that's a challenge. <laughs> but regardless, it is a good example, as you said, why you do want to have a 30 meter rule, why you want to make sure yeah. that from a risk minimization perspective, you don't fly too close to some really expensive cars. Yeah, I'd be very happy if that happened to me uh, and it fell on the concrete. I can tell you <laughs> that's, a, that's a good, that's a really good day. Um, and, and if you've ever, uh, you know, touch wood, uh, uh, we've, we've never had um, a, a drone injure a person, but that's a whole different video, that one. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm just looking at the comments. Um, Peter um, did calibrate it. Um, I've had a chat to him. Um, Peter takes risks. Um, he does in some ways different to what a lot of people would do. Um, I know he does fly um, longer distance and generally it's either over farmland or recently he's been flying over Varosha, which is a deserted city. Really interesting photography. All of that aside, it smashed and he didn't do it. Okay, good. Let's move on. Yeah. Um, speaking of going up and going up high, um, Peter doesn't go up high, but this particular aircraft does. Let's have a quick look at this. Now, I don't have any audio on that. So this particular aircraft is, uh, has been developed in China. It's a small multi-rotor drone that can climb to 5,000 meters. This is the XM20. Now, this that's, particular... That's no small multi-rotor, mate. <laughs> well, I'm reading the text here, okay? <laughs> but let me say this, right? So this particular video footage is not the current one. There's no video footage or even still photos of the current drone. This footage yeah. was from um, almost a year ago, and this is an earlier version of the XM20. That one could go up to 4,200 meters. This yeah. one, the latest version of that, can go up to 5,000 meters, and it can uh, with a weight of only 20 kilograms. Mm. So interesting. 
Wow. Straight out of China. The same people who make that are also doing some other more interesting aircraft um, for military applications. But I just thought that's a pretty impressive um, altitude there. Let's move on. It is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's very impressive. So if you've got something in the air now, we've always had a look at, um, you know, what to do with counter drone measures. This is using, we've seen lasers striking drones out of the air, but this is something a little bit different. So there's a Swiss startup um, that is um, firing laser at a drone charger using lab grown diamonds. They can focus the laser beams with enough energy to stay stable over long distances, powerful enough to charge photovoltaic cells on a drone in flight. Wow. That's pretty clever. Yeah. Um, I had this idea one time that what if you had an airborne uh, platform, uh, uh, like a multi-rotor and so forth, uh, on a sunny day, it could have uh, mirrors, you know, like you see on a, a solar array on a, spa- on a satellite, and it would direct uh, the, the actual, concentrate the energy on a ground station. But uh, that's like, a, I mean, using the laser, obviously, of course, makes perfect sense in concentrated energy. But mm. one day we will use sunlight for this purpose. Um, it, you know, we're using it a lot already, but mm. uh, it'll be fantastic when it's used to power um, little platforms like that, lightweight machines. Fantastic. Absolutely. And just out of interest, the same company is doing um, further research in how they can power satellites, right? I don't know enough about satellite technology to know. I, I would have assumed that they would be already using some solar technology yeah, but yeah power solar yeah but yeah. in addition to powering it via this they're also using it as a data link over the same spectrum so that makes it even more interesting let's move on next one for today is now everyone's heard of um, mh370 um, now the technology that we're going to have a look at here is not something that's going to fix um, mh370 and what picture is that? That's a triple seven, I think. Um, oh, that's right. I was trying to remember what photo I put in there. So that was the MH370 stock footage that I found somewhere. But here's the point. There's um, a company, um, a group of authors at the University of Bologna in Italy. They've decided to use artificial intelligence for search and rescue operations at sea. Now, the relevance of drone swarm in this case as well and the use of technology is pretty clear. It's a really great idea. And if that was around at the time that um, 370 went down, the ability to go and send out drones to go and um, comb large parts of the ocean, obviously you'd need a floating vessel for them to come back to. I'd assume you'd be using fixed wings so you can get more endurance out of them, et cetera, et cetera. But the whole idea of going and automating that, really cool. Yep. That's a great idea, and I think, uh, you know, the Navy is definitely pushing, Navies all over the world are pushing UAV technology from their ships because they can look over the horizon, um, they can search for things, they can launch them much quicker than helicopters um, into environments that aren't necessarily that uh, friendly to the helicopter Mm. and weather. So, yeah, a lot of stuff like that happening. But swarm technology, um, where it's sort of finding its place now in entertainment, will be uh, very, very big, not only in military applications, but in search and rescue as well. Imagine, mm. you know, sending out, uh, you've lost a bushwalker uh, in a certain area and you've got a, uh, you know, a, well, 100, 150 uh, swarm UAVs that you can just launch and have them go for it. They can hit the area so quickly, um, they then cover a massive area so quickly at low level. Absolutely. Um, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um- so speaking of choppers that you just mentioned in that one there, there's um, a guy that's been fined. Let me go and put my title up for that one. And there we go. So this guy yes. was sprung. This, this happens too often, actually. You know, it really does. It's, it's um, really disappointing. I don't have any um, interesting photos. I've just put a phantom up there for the sake of something. But this guy in um, the UK has been um, fined after his drone was flying underneath a police helicopter and that um, helicopter was searching for a missing woman at the time. So this is a Russian speaking man in um, Cambridgeshire in the um, UK. He's the first person in the UK to be convicted of illegally flying a drone um, beneath the police helicopter during a search operation. Now, that's only the beginning of it. We've heard too many of these things and, you know, it's 
it's bad enough that it happens in the first place. But it goes further. Um, once police identified the, the drone, they, um, they followed him and someone went to his house and um, he said, no, go away. And then a police sergeant turned up and arrested him and then they searched his house. And they found his drone hidden behind a loft hatch in the bathroom, in the crapper. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Wait, yeah. it gets better. And the guy says he's left the drone there to protect it from the children. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah it's the children need protecting. Oh, look, the temptation is, you know, talked about it often, where you might be uh, very, very close to an emergency situation where there is no other emergency services where you're, you might be able to assist um, uh, with the aircraft. But unless Absolutely. you're actually on the, unless you've got your feet on the ground and you're there, don't go buzzing off and have a look because you don't really know yeah. um, uh, what what sort of mess you're going to get into. And it's it's certainly illegal in Australia. It's yeah. um, one of the big five don'ts. So, um, yeah, don't do it. Yeah. Okay, I've got two more news stories for today. Um, the first one, um, in the US, the um, LANC system, they have now processed more than 50,000 applications. Ooh, really that's great. cool. Really cool stuff. So people who want to go and fly in a place that they wouldn't otherwise be able to fly, they can get permission online in an app. Really cool. Yep. My question is, what's next? And I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping um, that DJI will look at what has happened with LANC and then remove all of the geofencing stuff from their aircraft. And instead, all of those requests will go off to your local regulator. There's no reason that we need um, a, a commercial entity controlling and regulating airspace in, in, in each of our countries. Yeah, I think that that will disappear as well. I think the geofencing will happen um, through the regulators. They they just can't demand it from the manufacturer because uh, we've only got DJI as the only person that that's got that kind of thing at the moment, and mm. um, you, you can still build your own aircraft and fly it where you like. So it it doesn't solve the problem. Um, and I think probably the best thing to do is to have the regulator do it. Lank works. Um, and it, it, honestly, again, if you if you're going to want to fly in the wrong place, um, you're not going to get a Lank approval to do it either. And mm. that's it's all all very well at the very day the next day when you get into a passenger airliner and take off um, you'll appreciate the fact that people aren't flying in the flight path of your aircraft absolutely so what we're going to do now normally we have our guest at this time now our guest today is not yet here he's um, he did notify me in advance that um, he may take a little bit of time what I'm just going to do as we're speaking is send him an email and make sure he's got the link Good, good. Um, sorry for the. Um, looking through the chat things, there, there was a bit of, um, uh, I suppose, viewer interjection about the Phantom that crashed. Yeah. Um, which which is interesting, which is good too. So once again, um, I suppose the the calibration issue is an important one. People have raised that as well. Yeah. Um, and you you really must uh, calibrate. I, were, I think we heard that Peter had calibrated the aircraft. Um, and I, I, what we really need to do is see the logs. Yeah. You know, it's very, very simple. I want some, and I, maybe we should chase them up, Greg. It'd be great to know. Yeah, uh, absolutely. There, you know, there it was, an airplane falling out of the sky. Um, we've had an aircraft replaced that did a very similar thing. Um, mm. One time, just uh, just lost the plot and descended into the ground heavily. Didn't do a shutdown, uh, of course, but... Um, you know. This much we do know, right? We saw on the video that he lost the link to the aircraft before it hit the ground. Yep. Right? So judging by that, what's going to cause you to lose link? It's not going to be compass calibration. Um, the other thing that we saw before it went down is he said, I'm going to ascend now. So all he was doing is going up. Um, he was yep. not going laterally. Um, there was nothing else in the sky. It was interesting that he happened to have, it looked like a 360 camera that he's gone and zoomed it to that part of the sky. Yep. There was um, no other um, ob objects or obstacles in the sky. He lost link and it came down. Yeah. The parachute would have, um, and because we've had it in this show as well, 
the mm. parachute would have mitigated a lot of risk there um, in terms of the aircraft might have still been in one piece at the end of it. And that's why um, I put that story straight after the parachute <laughs> one. <laughs> I, I, I did notice that. Um, you know, it, it, it would have made a difference as well. Mind you, those systems fail as well. Parachute systems uh, do fail and they can cause, you know, other problems if, uh, if it uh, come out. If it misfires. People used to, well, yeah. misfires and so forth. Again, mm. a misfire that brings the aeroplane down is not necessarily a bad thing either if it brings it down properly. Mm. Um, you know, there, there's still a lot of work to go there um, in terms of how how these things are going to be managed in future. But, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. I, we've done a bit of parachute work um, and had a couple of parachutes and, and tried some dropping. The, if you're using a Pixhawk uh, autopilot, it's very, very easy to do. Um, mm. provided the autopilot doesn't fail and it triggers the parachute because you can set that up as well. But a lot of the parachutes, aftermarket parachutes, now have their own sensor. Basically, yep. when the aircraft uh, tips over a certain angle, a uh, parachute deploys yeah. and shuts down the motor. And put it this way, for that one, from the time that he lost the link to the time that it was on the ground, you wouldn't have been able to react any faster. You couldn't as a human. No. Yeah. No, that, that's not going to happen. Um, and again, and again, time. and again, he, he had lost links. So even if he did something that was going to send a command through the aircraft and trigger a device, um, that would have mm. been. There a is a video. Well. There is a video of a restart up there too. Oh, here yeah, we go. I've seen that. So while we're waiting for Jamin to um, come along, um, we've got FPV Corner. Now, this is um, a video that was put together. Um, by uh, Greg Hilton. He's created um, this little edit for us. Um, the original um, pilot here is Cruises FPV. And um, he was just having a chill session after work. And um, it's really nice. It's a KISS V1 um, device. Let's have a look at that. Once a month. Cool. Uh, seen you with a non-GPS. I take the cello around the house, but it's nothing like this. Yeah. All the guys that do this coordinate the control. Okay, I'm back and um, Jamin hasn't answered the phone yet. So what we might do, we're going to do the giveaway. We're going to have the Osmo giveaway in just a moment. Oh, that was an abrupt stop. <laughs> no, that was good. Oh, I really zone out on that FPV stuff. I love it. Yeah, it I is look, beautiful. It's it awesome. Day. It's awesome. Yeah. Just yeah, getting inside it almost. You know what? Actually, before I do that, before I do the competition, there's a video that I had um that i was i've got a couple here let's do this first of all i'm going to have a look at 6.1 um this is a video that's been um put together again by greg hilton from some material from the abc and um it's a story called that out of body rush of drone racing um let's put that up now when you put these goggles on you see nothing in front of you so you could almost be there, uh, imagine yourself with your arms out wide, flying like a bird would. What we actually see is quite a sketchy bit of video. It's got static on it, it might have rolls in the video feed, or it could drop out at certain points. You've got to focus on not pushing yourself too hard, 
but just taking the corners smoothly, accelerating down the straights and just not crashing out. I work at a local hardware store and uh, my boss lets us come in and uh, fly in the timber yard. I've got some mates that I fly with and they come along too and we have a bit of a, a blast through the through the packs of pine and over the over the other bits of timber and shelving and it's it's really uh, one of the probably the best race tracks around. They can go anywhere from say 60 kilometres an hour to 150. It's it's so addictive. Uh, that's why I go out with my mates all the time and uh, my my friends at work they must get so sick of me talking about drones and FPV and because it, it's just something that I I'm so passionate about when you turn the drone back on yourself it's almost like a, a bit of an out-of-body experience at times you can hear it in your ears uh, this drone buzzing around you, but yet you're in it, but you're not. So it, it is a really strange feeling, but kind of cool in, in another sense. I'm in it for the long haul. I'm going to keep practicing. I'm going to train with my mates. We'll be flying hard. We'll set up time trials. We'll do all that sort of thing in order to get my skills uh, up there with the, with the top pilots in the world. The more I fly, Hopefully the better I'll get and next thing I'll be up on the podium there with the, the big check in my hand, that'd be nice. So that was an um, interesting video put together based on some original footage from the ABC, Australia's Australian Broadcasting uh, Corporation. Really good story. Um, mm. And I've got one more. Now this one is also from um, original source from the ABC, the world's best drone racer. Um, let's have a quick peek at that one as well. Yeah. Hi, I'm Rudy Browning. I'm 15 years old and I'm a professional drone racer from Brisbane. Drone racing is essentially racing and building drones. I've got a soldering iron and a workshop at home. I've also got a local park near me, which I'm often training and building and fixing and racing. So yeah, it's heaps of fun and I really enjoy it. I qualified for the uh, FAI World Championships in Shenzhen based on the event that I went to in Sydney. Um, I placed highly in that event qualifying me for the, uh, the race in China. We've got the yellow drone of Australia out the front, the red drone of Latvia in second place through the bridge is second. The race in China had over 127 competitors from 34 different countries so there was some um, brutal competition and uh, yeah I'm super happy to have uh, taken away the win. For the 2018 championship, he's going to take it. When I crossed the line in first place, I was just so overwhelmed and so happy. Um, so much work and dedication has gone into this racing. I've had a lot of bad luck, and uh, I feel like that bad luck has made this win even sweeter. Mr. Rudy Browning, the champion. Back home, uh, my parents and a bunch of other friends were watching the live stream on a big TV, and apparently it was pretty intense. So yeah, everyone's super, super happy, and uh, yeah, a really good result. Drone racing is great for kids um, from all ages. It's good for like, it's a good family environment, it's a good community, and it's really fun. In order to start drone racing, you need a controller. That's what you, that's what's got the two joysticks and that's how you control it. You also need a pair of uh, virtual reality goggles, also known as FPV goggles for first person view. Um, that way you can see the camera and what's happening on the drone live and pretty much zero latency, which is amazing. And there's heaps of Facebook forums and groups and lots of YouTube videos on how to get into it and uh, yeah, it's really accessible because um, the internet's got heaps of information and yeah, people are always welcome to help you out. So uh, Team Australia also came first in the team racing event. Korea was some fierce competition, uh, I knew it would be close. I'm just so, so happy to have won and I'm so happy it ended the way it did. There's a series called DCL, the Drone Championships League. Um, there's 16 races in eight different countries all around the world, starting in Switzerland, so that's very exciting. Uh, team FBVR and Australia will be representing. It should be a really exciting uh, next year, and uh, I can't wait to continue with it and see what the future has to hold. And that was a great clip. That one actually, um, again, came from the ABC from a segment that they do called Behind the News. 
Um, really great to see um, a young, talented Aussie um, as the world's best drone racer, and he's only 15 years old. He was 14 when I saw some of his work shot, but um, 15 years old in that clip. So we've, while we've been playing some of that, we've now got our guest. But before I do that, I'm just going to type that in chat again relating to Peter. So if you can support him, I'll put details of that into the chat. Time for our guest. Let's... Let's go with um, Jamin Hudson. Hi, Jamin. How are you doing? Yeah, good, mate. How are you going? All right. I'm going absolutely awesome. It's great to have you here. And um, I've, I've seen some of your work and been amazed by it. Um, how long have you been flying for? Uh, I started flying drones in late 2014. Yes, yeah, so I was, guess I was one of the earlier adopters. It was back in the days where it had to be a GoPro and a, a Phantom 2 coupled together. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I've been loving it ever since. Yeah, okay. Look, I'm, I'm just going to cut straight to um, some of your material just to have a chat about that in a couple of minutes. Let's just play that. I'm very lucky to have had uh, hundreds of millions of people around the globe recognise my work and view it online. <laughs> so like earliest memories are, are days out on the water. Enjoy the outdoor world. I want to you know, explore the underwater world again using a new technology that's emerging. Being able to explore from the sky is amazing, man. but I'm no longer content with just droning. I'm gonna, I want to be back in the water, back on the water. Uh, experiencing the wildlife uh, up close and personal. So this trip is going to give me the opportunity to uh, fly a drone, but instead of uh, in the air, it'll be under the water. Fitzgerald so I'm just going to turn the audio of that clip down a little bit. We'll let it keep playing, but um, you mentioned in the clip there that you want to go under the water. So t talk to me about the story about how you got into droning in the first place. Uh, so basically, uh, droning came about for me. Uh, I had a uh, uh, motorbike accident in 2008 and uh, when I was 17. And I basically was looking for a new hobby that was accessible to me in a wheelchair. Uh, droning sort of found me in a weird sense uh, the the footage you saw of the pink lake there that's called lake hillier which is about a five-hour boat ride away from esperance and we had a gentleman come into the shop one day and he wanted to go down there uh and uh, a lot of people want to go there they just don't quite realize how uh you know difficult it is to access anyway this guy was adamant that he wanted to go there and it turns out um he was the chief marketing officer for dji uh, um, who I didn't know who they were back then. No one, it wasn't a well known company at that stage. Uh, so uh, we took him down there and he filmed uh, some promotional footage to uh, for a new drone they were going to be releasing. And he gave me some of the footage, and uh, immediately I was sort of blown away by the perspective it gave you. Um, I was hesitant about buying one at first because I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to fly just because I, um, uh, I don't have any dexterity in my hands. Eventually, though, uh, my family said, oh, look, just get one, and if you can't fly it, we'll just sell it, you know. So I got it and uh, uh, just started capturing the wildlife and coastline around Esperance here and have been loving it ever since. Yeah, it looks absolutely gorgeous. And you've got a big connection to the water? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So I, uh, my family started a uh, dive business in 1983, uh, so my that's, that's uh, seven years before I was born, so... My earliest memories are of days out on the water and uh, um, and basically I learned to dive when I was 10 
uh, surfing all the time growing up and everything like that. So this was a good way to uh, reconnect with that uh, and uh, uh, get out on the, you know, get out in nature once again. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you mentioned in there, has that actually happened yet, the underwater vehicles, underwater drones? Has that happened yet or...? Uh, look, I do actually have one now. Yeah, I've got a. Uh, I haven't actually been able to use it yet. Get it in the water. I've just been a little bit busy, but I will be uh, uh, testing it out soon, which will be great. Uh, so that's um, uh, something very exciting to start. Uh, you know, doing that under the water, capturing hopefully uh, wildlife interactions here in air, uh, and then that'll be able to sort of help tell more of a story, I guess, than just the drone aspect. Uh, mm. show some of the underwater. Uh, you know, um, you know, wildlife shots. Yeah, no, it looks absolutely beautiful. Well, I've got one more clip that I'll just put a little bit of your uh, material up. This is um, a video of a school of salmon meeting some dolphins. <laughs> awesome. Let's play yeah, that. Yeah, that was uh, filmed in about June this year. Yeah, let's play that. So you would have um, also noticed for those that are in the chat room, it's um, Nightbotters putting out a link to Jamin's website. I encourage you to go and <coughs> click on that link and Oops. Yeah, thanks, mate. Yeah, no, so I've got it all linked together just there. The, I'll try that again. My mic was button. just my mic was muted a second. I'll just try that again. So if you have a look um, in uh, in the chat room, there's um, Nightbot is posting um, a link to Jamin's website. And from there, you can have a look at that, go to the website. You can from there go to the YouTube channel, Instagram, and a few other bits and pieces as well. There's one thing I did notice. You've got a, a calendar um, that you're doing for, for next year. Yeah, mate. Yeah. So I, uh, I produce a calendar each year and... Uh um, this year, uh, I is probably like, I'm not just saying this, I'm, it's my proudest one yet. I've managed to get some cool different wildlife photos and stuff like that in there. And I'm uh, selling and raising money to try and get a, a modified van that I can drive from my wheelchair. Uh, so then I, I won't have to always rely on other people to drive me places so I can drone and stuff like that. So, uh, this will be the second year I've been uh, fundraising for that. So uh, hopefully uh, next year I might be able to purchase that. They are unfortunately quite expensive. But, um, yeah, that'll be absolutely life-changing for me, just being the, the freedom. You know, it's been 10 years that I haven't been able to drive myself anywhere, so that would absolutely change my life once again. That would be like getting my license again for the first time, I guess. Absolutely. Look, um, Jamin, you've got some wonderful material. As I said, please, everyone watching, do go to the channel, check it out, have a look at some of that. And um, thanks, Jamin. Is there anything you wanted to add about your droning experience? What would you say to someone who hasn't yet got into it or just, just oh, any comments? No, I mean, just like anything, if you get into it, um, you know, for the right reasons. I think some people nowadays, they, they just want to get into it to try and make some money or something like that. But I think if you get into it because you want to do it for a hobby, uh, it can really, uh, you know, bring you a lot of joy. It certainly does that for me. Uh, I love doing it, you know, and I love getting out, going to different places, meeting different people. Um, and, I mean, look, I mean, here I am talking to you um, because of drones sort of brought us together, you know. So yeah. uh, it's a great little community out there and, um, uh, yeah, no one that I'm very um, uh, grateful to be a part of for sure. Okay. Look, thank you for, for being our guest. By all means, stick around in the background. We're going to give away something right now. So we'll, um, we'll get into that. Let me press the button on that. I'm not organized because I've done things out of order. There we go. There we go. So we're giving away um, a DJI Osmo Mobile. This has been our challenge for a while to give this thing away once we hit 1,000 subscribers and we've hit that mark. Yahoo! And yoo-hoo, we finally got there. 
So we're going to put something up on the screen in just a few seconds. So this is the YouTube comment random picker thing. Now, before we go and run this, so I'll just explain what happens. It gets all the comments out of the video where people entered. And once we do that, it's going to pick one at random. But it is important to note that the competition entry condition said, you must say in your video, I want to win the DJI Osmo Mobile. So if we pick one and we don't have that in the, in the response, to be fair to the other people who did follow the instructions, we'll put it back in the barrel and we'll try again. Okay, so let's go with that. We'll pick the first one now. Put that full screen. Have you got a drum roll, John? <laughs> there you go. That's what you get on Sunday morning. They're expensive, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll click that start button. There we go. And we've got all those names flying there. We've got a winner, Free Skyer 23. Now, he unfortunately didn't follow the instructions. So, Free Skyer, next time, you've got to say what it says to do in the video. You've got to enter correctly. We'll try again back into the barrel. Elevated views. I can't read it from here, but I'm getting my producer to give me a thumbs up. Is that correct? I would like to win the DJ Osmo Mobile. Yes, I think that we've got a winner. Elevated views. Congratulations. You've won the DJ Osmo Mobile. I'm going to send that out to you. But obviously, I need to know where you are. Um, so do me a favor, send me your postal address and um, list that you are the winner of that particular prize. To get an email to me, I'll just put that back up on the screen. <clears throat> So that is the viewer video email address, upload at gregkunit.com. Just use the same one to send me your postal details. Um, and you need to send that within the next 30 days to make sure we get that. Otherwise, it'll go back into the prize pool. So do send me your details. Congratulations, Elevated Views. How cool is that? Okay. So what we're going to do now, um, we've got the Australian videos. So this is a collection of videos. Um, Jamin, you're new to our channel. This is a collection of videos that we have from around the country. And um, every week we've got some new bits and pieces collected from um, all sorts of locations. Uh, Greg um, Hilton, who um, compiles that together for us, he's a um, former ABC TV cameraman and um, does a great job putting it together. So let's go and play that video now. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. You go, Mate, man. if you've got to go. <laughs> yeah, man. Okay, Enjoy thanks. your climb, man. See you, Jamin. See you, Jamin. Okay, so Jamin's gone off to work, which is great. Now, the first one we've got here is Mount... Can you say that? Mount Tib Tiboragon. Mount Tiboragon. And click on the links and second one today from Ted Van Eaton into the Grampians in Victoria. Now, John. <laughs> we, we, we want these things from a lose your drone. Photography. And we're going to en we're going to enjoy it for its. You know, again, the only reason you need to see it is so you can mitigate the risk of a low-flying helicopter that might be working in the area. So look, you know, I say go out there and manage the rules. It's about the risk. Um, and, you know, I saw a lot of uh, very uh, good comment um, 
that we were rightly pointed out, really the battery is the one that's going to do that. Um, a disconnect and falling out of the sky, everything else has usually got a fail safe mechanism. But the one thing it won't, if that battery on the uh, Phantom 4 particularly um, isn't uh, in properly. Or um, if it's got that yep. arcing problem that you mentioned. Now, we, we've yep. looked at that before. That Those weren't on new batteries. Do you believe that could happen with a newer battery? Yeah, look, I've seen enough of it now. We've seen three batteries that have failed with arcing. And so they, they tend not to fail to that extent. Um, where, you know, we're watching them uh, come back and so a little bit of electrical um, uh, burning and arcing first. Not to say that they would, but you know what, probably the single biggest um, fall out of the sky disconnect problem um, that, that we see is the, um, the battery not being secured properly. And look, it's too easy. Box, you, you snap it in, you, you just can't have the source fail. It'll be of it um, didn't properly. Um, John, um, yep. the, the video we've got at the moment, R scene 33. Um, oh, yeah. This is Ganthumi Point in Broome, Western Australia. Visitors love this segment the best. You can see why. Really the best way to see our country uh, these days. By drone. Yep, absolutely. From the air. And um, to put words in your mouth, beautiful straight horizon. I know you were going to say it. I wasn't going to say it this time. Look <laughs> at that, though. Bolt straight horizon. Come on, you know. And here we've getting... got we've got Oz Beach Andy um, with and the name of this place. I had a laugh at it when I saw it. Petrel Cove, P E T R E L Cove. It's oh so, wow. Yeah, and the name of a place sounding like a gas station, but it's very very beautiful nonetheless. Um, this is at um, Encounter Bay is the location. Oh, lovely. Andy always has some great footage. And we've got one more in just a couple of moments. While we're um, just over here at the moment, I know that I think it was the Everyday Dad had a stream that was happening at this time or just about to start every week. Is that correct? If those in the chat room could confirm that. Okay, and here's our last one today. Um, this one is the Western Sydney FPV squad, Bando Heaven. We had on um, very recent to doing more testing with it. It's still on 30 frames per second, but I am planning on doing that. But it's Telstra's behaving today. No, my daughter's actually signing to. Uh, yeah, bring again. It's your fault. So just while we're um, getting to the end of that clip, just a few reminders. Um, send in the best gag you can come up with. Whoever's got the best gag is going to be the co-host next week. Ken, sorry, you've got enough gags and um, we've heard them all before, so you're not eligible to enter. Unless what about you, the, unless the you, pigeon? 
The pigeon. Oh, you can you can send your pigeon over. That'll be fine. But for anyone else who wants to um, try and be the co-host next week, send in via email your gags, and I'll put the email address up in a few moments. Oh! Interesting way to end that clip. Yeah, it's true. I suppose you have to have a ladder if you're an FPV flyer in some circumstances. Yeah, leave <laughs> the drone on the roof. I'm thinking you could probably, yeah, probably rescue it with a, you know, a grappling hook and a and a 650 size aeroplane. Probably go and get it. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, we've come to the end of the show. I was asking before if anyone knew. I think it was um, Everyday Dad had a, sh a stream that starts around this time. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but if it is, I um, encourage you to all go and watch him and uh, definitely drop in, hey, came to see you from Oz by Drone. Let's give him a bit of a bombing in the chat room if it is the time. I hope mm. I got it right. If it's not, sorry. Um, other than that, community service announcements before we finish for the day. Number one, how to um, send us email, upload at gregkunit.com. If you've got a viewer video, please do send that in. If you would like to share something on social media, and we definitely encourage you to do that, there are our social media details. Oops, let's press that one more time. It came back. If you want to send us anything by post, 5 slash 127 Princess Highway, Sylvania, New South Wales, triple two four Australia. And now, John, I've got something just for you. Wait for just it. Just for me. Just for you. Yay, look at that. We got drone camp up there. Yeah. Fantastic. So drone camp, for those of you who um, are in Australia and have you're either a munchkin or you've got a munchkin and you want to send them to learn how to fly a drone and have some fun. I'll put it back one more time. Drone Camp is um, listed on that website. Go to the website, have a look, check out the dates and um, the information and encourage you to send your little ones in. Come and be part of it. Um, uh, one more classified, Greg, if I made it, I'd squeeze it in. Yeah. Um, we've decided to move um, one of our inspires on. We've got a, an absolutely as new inspire one pro version two with the x5 camera um it's listed on ebay at the moment so you can find it pretty easily um looks like it's going to go cheap they are going cheap magnificent aircraft if you're interested got three batteries uh all the deal and you'll see in the comment lines it mentions morrison aero robotics so you'll know which one it is but um any anybody who wants to go grab an inspire and and looking for that kind of camera that kind of aircraft um we've got an absolute beauty here it's going to go out in the next day or so all right. Okay. Awesome. Look, that's all for now. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for being in the chat. Let me just quickly go there and see if there's any. This is one time at drone camp. Anything interesting? <laughs> yeah, one Mick time. Malloy. This one time at drone camp. Yeah, thank, thanks, Mick. Yeah, good. Yeah. Band camp for, for drones. Yep, absolutely. What yeah, else have we got? It's going to be a lot of fun. When you check out, I'd love to get some comments from some of our. Um, regular listeners and or what viewers and flyers too because on the on the website we've got up the schedule there it's going to be a pa absolutely packed three days um we're gonna we're gonna get these guys flying right from the ground up uh, teach them how to put batteries in uh probably probably one of the first lessons uh they're all going to get a tello and learn to program a tello and um you know it'll be it'll be a real aviation based um and you get your wings at the end of it um so we're going to have some fantastic people aopa is going to be there with their simulators um, Avi Assist are going to give certificates out to credit um, people towards their REPL license. So once they've done drone camp, they'll have a credit um, towards their license. Yep, absolutely. And last thing, just a reminder for those who want to help Peter out um, with regard to that phantom that fell out of the sky, I've put that up on the screen one more time for you now. We've got a PayPal or a Patreon link there. I'm sure he'd appreciate that. Yeah, good work. Okay, that's all for now. See you next time. Bye, everyone. Okay, see you, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.